Hello everyone, welcome to our Kenora webinar, Elevating Learning with Assistive Technology for School Age Children. Uh, today we are extremely fortunate to be joined by Penny Nelson, a WA-based OT has, who has worked with children for over 30 years and who was one of the first OTs to provide school-based OT services in Perth. Uh, in 1995, Penny, along with her business partner, Karen, established Skill Builders Therapy Services for children in Leeming, Western Australia. And Skill Builders was developed to provide a team-based therapy service for children, including speech therapy, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Thank you for being here today, Penny. Thank you, Yvette. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, um, we're also joined today by Kerry Kingham, CEO of The Chew Shop, a purpose-built online marketplace for assistive technology with a user experience focused on minimising invoicing issues for NDIS participants, their support coordinators and plan managers. Kerry has also got lived experience working within the education industry and has navigated the gauntlet of getting the best outcomes for her kids in the school, school system when their needs were outside the norm. Thanks for joining us today, Kerry. Thank you. Always good to be here. Okay, <laughs> amazing. My name's Yvette. I'm part of the team here at Kenora, and I'm also joined by Erin, who will be manning the chat. Erin, are you going to pop up or you, you're good? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> there she is. Hi, Erin. Um, if you're a Kenora member, you may already know us as coaches within the community. Just before we get started, a brief background on Kenora. If you're not already a member, Kenora is a safe and supportive online community where you're able to get support for your NDIS questions from us coaches and our community of thousands of other NDIS participants, their families and support coordinators. You can also find service providers on our marketplace directory who are experts in their field. If you're already a Kenora member, you may be aware that we, we record these sessions to share the replay of the webinar and any resources that we speak about on Kenora. If you're not already a member, don't worry, we will send you the replay and the resources direct to your inbox. If you look to the top of your screens, there's a chat button. Please click on that now. This is where you can introduce yourself into your comments and ask any questions as we go along. Erin will be monitoring the chat for any questions that come up and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Any that we don't get to, we'll make sure to put the answers into the Kenora community and provide you with direct feedback. All right, before we jump into today's content, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Kenora acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and future. We acknowledge the culture, diversity, knowledge and experiences of First Nations people and celebrate their contributions and specifically those living with disability, their families, carers and individuals dedicating themselves to a career in supporting people with disability. All right. So getting to the topic for today, and I'm going to talk for a bit before we get our two experts to, um, to chime in, um, just for some background context. Um, with the recent Royal Commission report into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability, uh, which encompasses a huge spectrum of issues we are hoping to break down in Kenora over the coming months. Today, we're touching on the findings that special schools catering to students with a disability and the segregated approach to education they offer uh, contribute to the devaluing of people with disability, which in the report is quoted as being a root cause of the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation they experience in education and beyond. So the validity and efficacy of this model of education and the Australian education system as a whole is under the spotlight again. I mean, when, when is it ever out of the spotlight? But yeah. still. Um, Research suggests children with disability fare better in inclusive mainstream education and able-bodied students who are educated alongside those with disability hold fewer prejudicial views, which makes sense. Three of the six commissioners called for the end of special schools by 2051 and no new enrolments from 2032. The remaining commissioners did not think a total phase out was needed to achieve, to achieve inclusive education. Schools that primarily enrol students with disability need not operate in a manner that isolates those students from their peers and separation in some circumstances could be beneficial, they said. All commissioners, however, agreed that the status quo could not continue. <laughs> Here we are. So today we're asking the question, 
is assistive technology one of the tools that needs to be integrated en masse into the education space to help in bridging some of the gaps in learning for students with disabilities? Or is it essentially throwing a pencil eraser at a spilled bucket of paint? Um, assistive technology is changing rapidly and is no longer confined to being specialised high-tech equipment. It can be low-tech, free or low-cost technology, or simply just settings that are built into devices that are already being used, used by kids in the school system. Uh, and assistive technology, if, if used across the whole student population, could benefit all students, not just those with special learning needs. I'll stop talking in a second. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just joining us now, the aim of today's webinar is to further inform parents, carers and those invested in the education sector on how AT can be accessed and implemented as another practical tool to help your kids navigate life and learning. Uh, we'll talk about gathering a team of experts, including your child's school, how to manage your expectations of what AT can do and finding out who's responsible for providing what when it comes to supplying AT. All right, here we go. Let's get into it, ladies. Um, understanding assistive technology and education. So Penny, if I can start with you. You've been in paediatric occupational therapy for 30 years now. And when we <laughs> spoke earlier, yeah, when we spoke earlier, um, you've said that you've seen the idea of assistive technology and is specifically within an education context change so much over the years? Like what have been your observations over your time? Absolutely. So 30 years ago um, is when we really started having children with um, any any disability or special need go into the mainstream school. So, yeah. so here in Perth, we, we were um, first starting to school visit teachers 30 years ago. There were two of us in the whole metropolitan area and one visiting teacher from um, the education department and the three of us worked together to support kids um, across the whole metropolitan area with integration. But there were a lot of issues around that, like it, you know, like there wasn't the technology that there is now, obviously. So curriculum adaptation was was a lot harder for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so we would get sort of terms like mainstream dumping being used because there wasn't the resources that we now have. So, so as therapists, we were trying to support teachers as best we could with what um, with using assistive technology back then, and that might have been putting a key guard on a typewriter so that a child could access that to to write. Whereas these days, we have all sorts of amazing um, tools that we can we can introduce with teachers. So, so yeah, dramatic changes over the over the last um, thirty years, and we now have many, many therapists going into schools to support teachers and kids. And and here in WA we have the SEND, which is the, what does it stand for again, um, schools, School of Special Education Needs, and they have disability and sensory and behaviour engagement subsections. And they are a huge organisation now, so they're a school in themselves there to support. They are, they are almost all teachers and they are there to support teachers supporting kids in in mainstream and ed support settings so so there's a lot of resources out there now to support the whole process yeah. um yeah, yeah. So i guess it's a job in itself to kind of to locate and connect all of those resources to the specific child's need at any particular right. time yeah so that's the i guess the challenge is finding and the challenge and together that's right. And the challenge is very much that it is not a one size fits all thing, mm. obviously. It's very specific to specific kids and environments that they're in, teaching style of the teacher, impacts things. There's a whole lot of variables. So, so um, you know, I, I think um, like as a therapist, you're going from school to school and you sort of say, oh, okay, we tried that with this child over here. That worked fantastically. But in this scenario, we've got this, this and this to consider. So, but if we change it by doing this, then it might work and we trial it. And, oh, yeah, that's okay. What about if we do it this way as well? So there's there's trial and error, obviously, involved. Yeah, but, um, but that's um that's the, the process, isn't it? So, yeah. And, and as therapists, we're very much information sharers because mm -hmm. we're, um, you know, trialling things in different situations and, and figuring out how to adapt it to meet another child's needs. So, um, you can and start with a template, but it then obviously has to be modified each time. Yeah, 
it's a very yeah. specialist yeah for sure that's right yeah and that's where it gets very grey too when it comes to um ndis funding and that sort of thing because there yes. are so, so many variables it's not a black and white situation or very rarely so very very rarely yes. yeah so it's inevitably convoluted yes <laughs> Yeah. Well, before we get too convoluted and, and stuck into the, the quagmire that is funding for AT and NDIS in general, um, Kerry, just just a brief background on, so you've worked in the education space and now you're obviously in the assistive technology space, but you've also got some um, experience with your own children and was, is it your daughter that is now a teacher and has implemented yeah. some... Yeah, well, my, my um, to be daughter in law. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I worked for um, in many moons ago. Actually, when our kids were very young, I worked for Scholastic Education. So I was going out into schools, you know, sharing resources and helping teachers do professional development. And in South Australia, there was a, a big push when I was in that role to incorporate information and communication technologies across every curriculum area. And we saw at that time that trying to just introduce technology into the classroom and be able to adapt it for children at different levels to be able to use, to be able to adapt exist, existing resources to fit into that sort of new requirement was really challenging. So then I think when we add in, you know, the variety of different needs for children within a classroom, within a school, it just makes it more and more complex. And I think, as Penny said, you know, there's not one size fits all. And mm -hmm. so when I was going out and talking to teachers back then, it was really about you have to know everything that's out there. And that's that's the biggest problem, that you you have to be across this massive amount of information, this massive amount of resources, and know where to go to get that information to start off with. Well, I would just like to um, just level set and say we don't know everything about AT no, and we can't no. answer all of the questions today no. because, as you have both said, it's a very mm. individualised situation. So today is really about figuring out what questions to ask and where to go and what potentially is available to parents and carers and students out there in the context of assistive tech. So, Absolutely. well, um, and it was a different, I'm sure it was a very different um, uh, working environment liaising with schools back then because you didn't have Google at your fingertips and you didn't have the, the web to kind of literally categorise and find the resources that were available to you at the time. So you did need to carry it around with you. Exactly. And look, it would have been about the same time, Penny, because my oldest is now 29 and I was doing this role when they were both just starting school. So it was around 25, you know, 24, 25 years ago. And um what I saw was that in South Australia, we had this um, technology school of the future where all of the different technology and assistive tech sort of curriculum was developed and where resources were showcased and where all the professional development was done. And it was still very much seen as an add on why now it's very much integrated into the classroom yeah. that, you know, that information technology is part of their curriculum every day and it's part of their life every day. But again, I think it still comes back to knowing where to go to find the info and building relationships with the right sort of people. So my da mm -hmm. daughter-in-law to be is a um, junior primary primary teacher and she's worked in some quite disadvantaged schools and she's also worked in some very mixed ability classrooms. So she's seen sort of both ends of the scale. And, you know, just hearing her talk about how challenging it is to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis with mm -hmm. the class sizes, the funding and the resources available. So it, yeah. it is, as you say, a really complex beast but I, my biggest thing is to be informed, you know, read, mm -hmm. um, voraciously search out information and, you know, and find out where you can go to get those, um, the details that you need and the resources that you need. Mm -hmm. And as parents, um, parents can be very active in that process mm -hmm. now because they have access to all the information just like yeah. we do through mm -hmm. Google and all the rest of it, whereas you know in previous years that wasn't the case and they were very dependent on yeah on expert opinion yeah yeah and, and mm -hmm. our experiences with with other kids and that sort of thing now they can bring their experience to the table they can source information by facebook chat groups and all the rest of it as well there's lots of ways to find out mm. if like options for helping a child with a particular issue um, and then they can say that to the therapist and the therapist might say oh wow that sounds like a great idea let's investigate mm. that so there's a little more um collaborative for working yeah. together as yeah. a team um, yeah. now than there used to be which is really really something we can tap into absolutely amazing so mm. before we launch into more of the um 
who's responsible for what penny can you from your perspective as a therapist in your experience working with kids in an education setting what what are we speaking of when we say assistive technology so like what, what's it's the everything so it goes from <laughs> like like a ruler is a as a piece of a assistive equipment for mm -hmm. all kids and we might adapt it a bit for a child who has difficulty holding it so so that's assistive technology right through to the fanciest um at um it kind of solutions as well yes so like yeah. in my in my ch um, children's school i mean they have smart boards as standard in all of the the classroom so they can project um videos and and um like soundscapes and stuff onto this board and then that prints yeah. off the things from there. So, I mean, yeah. that's, that's your high-tech yeah. technology, yeah. assistive tech. But, but then uh, wheelchairs considered assistive yep. technology. So, assistive anything tech. yep. that, so that's where it gets quite blurry because it's sort of like who funds what. Yes. Um, and so that's sort of. And here we are today. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because things that a, a child needs in any setting um, is NDIS funding. That's sort of the basic separation from it and yes. things that a child only needs specifically to access the curriculum in class is education department so yeah, yeah. so that's a very that's a good um kind of distinction to probably emphasize i think so as penny said so anything for the child to access the world around them anywhere mm -hmm. um then that is the individual and therefore NDIS potentially early intervention um, support services um, or other um, funding bodies uh, mm -hmm. and then anything to access the curriculum uh, education wise then the school needs to make reasonable adjustments so that that information is accessible to the child so that is the the line in the sand I guess for today's purposes it yeah. is yeah yeah, yeah. Amazing. Cool. So then um, we've obviously, okay, so then we've got the NDIS or the early intervention access process for kids who have been identified having disabilities or learning difficulties. And so obviously going through that path and that in itself is a, a journey and a gauntlet. And then we've got the education department and their various as we found out, Penny, um, or you you alerted me to the fact that each state and territory have their own ways, ways. of dealing yeah. with that. Yes. So that um, I've found all of the links for each of the state government's um, approach to um, adapting curriculum and their what they state as their responsibilities for students with disabilities and uh, special requirements. So those links will be available um, in the, the notes to this. Um, and obviously as part of that, some of the different state governments have different funding models, which are able to be accessed individually by schools and parents. And as you said, um, working collaboratively with your, any allied health people that you have as well. Um, but then, I, Kerry, I also wanted to go back to a conversation that we had when we were speaking about this webinar um, about your experience selecting the school that you sent your kids to in the first place and so how that kind of formed all your, the conversations that you had with the schools leading up to making that decision. So can you, can you take us back to that, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, my, my two boys were a little bit different. They weren't identified as having a disability. Um, they were identified as being falling into the gifted and talented stream. Well, we talked a lot um, about the the grey, that most schools are geared towards the grey, you know, the middle um, where it's kind of the norm. And that, that seems to be what, and I, I'm generalising, but it seems to be what most of them um, are most comfortable with. And for most parents, that's what you need to worry about. The challenge we had was making sure that the school had the right resources and the right approach for our children. We knew from assessments that we'd have done and this would be no different to somebody with a child with a disability you go and have your assessments done you get your reports you know what support you need or what you don't want to have and then it's about going in and actually having the conversation and advocating as you say to make sure it's the right school for your children now we went to our local school which was at the end of the street and I thought this would be fantastic you know we can walk to school every day went in and met with um the principal, you know, and talked to them about it and took the reports from um, the psychologist at the time and said, you know, we want to know what you do for 
gifted and talented, you know, how do you stretch children, how do you develop them? Oh, well, we get them running errands for the teachers and we get them doing special little projects and things. And I went, hmm, not quite what we were thinking about. So we were like, okay. Then we went to another local school, which was what they called um, a hub for gifted and talented. It was an R to 12 school. So that we thought that'd be great. They could stay there for the, all the way through. It's got a focus on gifted and talented. Went and met with them and you know, the, they said all the right things and showed us all the right information. And we ended up enrolling them there from kindergarten or preschool. We call it kindy here in South Australia. And the plan was for them to stay there all the way through. Started there and um, they were quite, it was quite good in the junior primary, then got to sort of the primary school and there was no focus on what we needed. So none of the things that they said would happen were really happening. So that was when I had to go into you know, mama bear mode, as my son would have called it back then. And you have to go in and start really asking the questions and challenging. And that's really difficult. And at the time, I was also working full time. So I had to then adapt, you know, when I could go in, when I could meet with the teachers. And I think that happens for a lot of parents, you might do a before school or after school drop off or pick up. So the time Mm -hmm. you have to meet with these teachers and actually understand what's going on is limited as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it took us a long time to try and adapt or find out how we could adapt what was going on at the school to meet um, my son's needs or our son's needs. And it wasn't until he went into a vertically grouped year four, five and six class who had a teacher who had actually done um, some specialised training in gifted and talented education and who didn't look at him as a year four, but just looked at him as a member of this class and treated them as individuals and, you know, adapted the curriculum to what they need. Now, he was in that class for two years and it was probably the best two years he had in school at that school as mm-hmm. soon as we moved away from that teacher it all changed again and it, so it's this mm-hmm. roller coaster all the time and I don't mm-hmm. think this would be a unique story mm-hmm. and it's yeah. sort of taught me about how to advocate for my children but also mm-hmm. back then I had to go and look for lots of other resources you know so other activities at other clubs other memberships and even I remember a teacher at the school saying you're so lucky your boys are in this this group and I'm like well, you know, they're, we're fortunate they have that potential. But I said this, the schools aren't. I mean, I put in there. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. I said the schools aren't actually geared towards this. You mm-hmm. know, the funding model, the the, the necessarily mm-hmm. the skills of all the teachers. So it, it's really challenging, and I can't imagine. You know, it would be even more complex if there was a child with a disability or multiple mm-hmm. disabilities that perhaps make them feel more isolated in other ways as well. So and it was what, a big lesson for me. There for them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it was a big lesson for me around how you can't be, I call it a passive parent um, mm-hmm. at school when you have children that fit outside of the grey. Mm-hmm. And I still call it that. I said, if you fit in that middle band, the education system is pretty great. Mm-hmm. If you sit outside of it in either spectrum, it's really, really hard work. Mm. And they didn't stay there through high school. We ended up sending them to a single sex Catholic school, which was completely the opposite to what I'd been brought up in and what I ever thought I would do. But we actually got the the boundaries and the structure and the the support that they needed to get them through high school there. Yeah. So it was a really interesting experience. As individualized as individual as students. It, it was yes, modified yeah. to their needs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Amazing. So, but yeah, it's it's a really tough gig doing that. So yeah, the, the 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 takeaway from that for me is that, um, <laughs> and I always remember having conversations with all my both of my parents were teachers, um, mm. and so them commenting about um, parents being the, yeah. the hardest cohort manage, for them to manage, deal with, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, which I absolutely. totally get, but also like th- these are our kids, so of course. So, and being their biggest advocate is essential to a successful outcome within the education system from day dot, like let alone with any other requirements. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And I'm, I mean, in my specific case, I'm very fortunate that the primary school that two of my three children go to have an in-house psychologist, occupational therapist and physiotherapist. So those that those services are then facilitated via the school, which wasn't necessarily one of the reasons that I enrolled them at the school, but it was, I was very aware that the school had those resources available and turns out they've they've been very helpful post COVID and post all of the other developmental things as well. So having that awareness of, of, and conversations with 
the decision makers and the um, educators in your children's journey is 100% necessary for sure. Um, Which state are you in, Yvette? I'm in Victoria. Victoria, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, I don't necessarily, and even, even in my research for this webinar today, I'm, I'm not even sure that that's entirely the norm either. I think I just happen to be in a good area yeah. for, for that to be, yeah. and for the school to prioritise those resources for their students. So I am very happy with that decision. Mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's a challenge in itself, isn't it? Like you mm. said, it's not the norm. So no. yeah, and how do you find out what the norm is? How do you find out whether your school is considered questions. to be good in this area or not so mm. good? And and like you were saying, Penny, now with the internet, it's much easier for parents to actually do some of that research mm. too, rather Absolutely. than having to, to visit mm. every school first. They can actually look to groups and look to chat rooms and go, well, what's the real lowdown on this school, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And people do do that all the time. So, mm. yeah. yeah. Amazing. So, I mean, and I just, um, all right, so we've got NDIS um, funding for the individual, education department um, funding, access to curriculum and learning environments. Um, then we've got even more grey, you have a grey area with some learning disabilities that aren't necessarily recognised by anyone um so penny do you uh in terms of like dyslexia and dyspraxia and various mm -hmm. other even um adhd while it can be considered as part of like an ndis plan it's not um accepted as a primary um disability so those sorts of um uh learning challenges for students are, um how, how what's a, an approach to take with that penny and, and what would you suggest for those situations I think that's um, another situation that varies across australia so mm. here in in perth um it like the schools themselves take on board a lot of that we have big issues with pediatricians here in wa at the moment and getting access to assessment and confirmation of diagnosis is virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. So like, we've got people, families having to go into state to get a diagnosis, but then they, wow. like if it's ADHD, for example, they can't then get ongoing medication. So so that's um, another issue again. Um, with the under nine now with NDIS, so that means a child yes. doesn't have to di have any diagnosis until they're over the age of nine, that that creates um, a lot more, like we're getting a lot more referrals for children who have NDIS funding with far um, less issues. So that's and, the NDIS early childhood approach where yes, they've, yes. they've moved the, the age range for under Up six to, to under nine. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're getting kids referred. I think the, the criteria is they have to have um, difficulties in two or more domains of, mm -hmm. of you know, development. So, mm -hmm. so that... And that's it. There's no um, other. There doesn't need diagnosis. to be a diagnosis. Yeah. So that right. opens doors for a lot of children for therapy, which which we're definitely um, seeing from a therapy point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the school system, that there there are a lot of um, ways of providing services. Um, that are funded in the education department without a diagnosis as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the kids, are, you know, if they're struggling in that, that, the schools will be putting in a lot of supports anyway. That's a yes. natural process for any child who's struggling with reading or whatever it is. So they will have those sorts of specialist sorts of things happening. So the kids can always access that as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's funny. I, it was. Um... Melbourne Cup public holiday yesterday and had people around for a barbecue and one of the mums, school mums said, I don't know why, like, um, fidget spinners aren't just part of the book list for, like, students across <laughs> oh the... Oh, my God, thanks God they're not. <laughs> <laughs> why is that, Penny? Why is that? Uh, you know, when we started introducing sensory tools back mm. in 2001, 2002, they weren't used in schools at all. Mm. And I feel like we've inflicted all of this on teachers <laughs> because, because um, you know, like they are designed to be used in specific situations to support right. a child's learning and the difference between a tool and a toy is really important to oh, to differentiate yeah. and for yeah. teachers to have full control of that situation is really right. important. Yeah. And so when you get every second child turning up with a fidget spinner, it's not that helpful. Yeah. 
yeah, if you're a teacher, true. you'd be just throwing your hands up. So I think... Um, yeah, tool versus toy, 100%. Yeah, exactly. Imagine. It's very important. Uh, yeah. yeah so. Imagine that they took my t my spidget, a fidget spinner. No, no, they took mine, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, all of that. A lot of schools flying now, across the classroom, yeah. yes. A lot of schools now have set up um, like a resource resource. Um, covered Covered. with sensory tools in it to trial with kids as appropriate Um, and then that works quite well when it comes to NDIS funding because they can say that this has been trialled so the parents might then seek that other item to use at home during homework time or whatever they can say it's been trialled at school and that was successful so Mm. um, that that helps with getting that across the line from an NDIS point of view as well Um, yeah so yeah awesome so I mean and that's something I mean that is something that that particular school would then fund as a resource for them to equip their students for them then to them to That's then right. resource themselves ongoing yeah right so here in WA um, a, a lot of schools have that set up now so mm-hmm. and like and across Australia we have a lot of schools buy resources from us so I know that yep. they're doing it across Australia as well yeah. so they'll have those resources available to all of the kids in the school as appropriate um and then if if a, you know, a child that says yes that child needs it all the time like a movie mm. question or something like that then they here in perth they would go through send to get um approval for that child mm. to have that and to have that funding for that child to have it in the classroom all the time mm-hmm. um, so that's the way it works here in Perth, um, mm-hmm. but but as we were saying, it's and it modifies everywhere yeah. else in Australia. In Queensland, yeah. they have therapists employed by the education department, and they would recommend um, equipment that's used in schools, and funding would go through their education department that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I'm not sure so much about other states, but yeah, we'll put, obviously I'll put the links and the resources up for people to follow yeah. specific to their circumstances. So that's fine. That's um, good, yeah. so I just wanted to establish um or talk further on building a team because we've talked about um, developing the relationship with the school um, and the educators, but then also yourself as a therapist, um, Penny, uh, what what would you say is the importance of assembling your team of experts um, to support children with their assistive tech um, tools? Um, When we were talking about this, um, you did express um, some concern that that waiting lists were being um, impeding kids access to that kind of support. So is that is that currently the situation from your experience? Oh, yeah. And across Australia, that would be the case still um, sort of been what, maybe four or five years now where wait lists have been pretty crazy so mm. so it might be that um a child has got access to speech therapy support but not yet ot and mm-hmm. so ideally say say for example if you were putting um augmentative communication system into a, a for a child in at school that gen, you know typically would involve the whole team like speech mm. ot it's like everyone to help support that um that implementation because it's a big deal. Um, so there would be a, a, a IEPs and you know, team meetings and the whole bit around around that to support that to, What's to an be IEP? successful. Oh, Individualised In, education, education plan? planning, yep. routines, yep. all of that sort of thing would be mm-hmm. happening to support that goal um, and support the child to, to become a regular user of AOC. It takes everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is that they may not yet have all of those people on board in the team. So so um, we do have to cover for each other or find out information to support each other in different ways like that. Um, so, so, so what might be ideal mm-hmm. might not necessarily be possible at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, when do you normally have parents and children presenting to you? Like, um, is it already, like, is it a kind of, is it a situation where they can plan ahead and put themselves on wait lists ahead of time or do you yeah. do you find that you're at like crisis point or beyond they needed this years ago sort of situation like what um, sort of age groups like and <laughs> sorry that's a lot of questions I'm just like how can we, we hack this how can we how can we hack this system? how can we hack it yeah um we have Definitely we have kids coming earlier than in the past, so there's a lot more preparation time. Um, 
I think there's a lot of issues around multicultural kind of situations and understanding um, and comprehension of what's required the system and different ways of um of using the system too mm -hmm. that where some people are very demanding of the system and some people are very realistic of the system and mm -hmm. and appropriate in the way they use it there's some people that that will push it to the nth degree and mm -hmm. um that that's not fair often mm -hmm. Um, mm. So that does happen, and and then there has to be. Some so we've got to be mama bear, there. but we can't rot the system. So right. <laughs> Absolutely, and if you seem to be someone rotting the system, well, that's just, yeah. that's yeah, black it's a no go. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. Yeah. You have to be walking that line very yeah. nicely. It's important mm -hmm. as a parent to to be advocating for your child a hundred percent, but but recognizing that there are lots of other people around with needs as well. So. Yeah. Um, like one of the issues that we really have as a practice at the moment is the requirement for functional capacity assessments with the NDIS. Yeah. That 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 negates ten other kids getting assessments mm. because it takes because so of the much time and the process. The time, yeah, that's yeah. right, mm. and the requirements of the NDIS. So, so we absolutely hate doing them <laughs> um, <laughs> because it, because of what it means to ten other kids um, mm. not getting access to a, to the service. Yeah, so. Can I ask too, Penny? Um, like I find that, and, and I mean, I haven't been the parent of a young child for a long, long time, but I think too that there seems to be um, quite a trend with once somebody's involved with a um, an allied health or a pro medical professional to sometimes forget that the parents can actually contribute to that care as much as the health professional does as well, and you can't just abdicate so the outside responsibility. Of that consult yeah, room. outside mm. of that consult room, you've got to put in all the other work and all the other, you know, behavioural things and support, mm. and that that potentially can really impact your child's progress as well. And I'm mm. look again, I'm not trying to make say that people are doing the wrong thing, but I think that you have to have that understanding as well that you're going to have an ongoing role in that. Even once they start school, it's not just the school's yep. responsibility. You know, you've got to take on. And be consistent and implement everything at home as well, which and is something that's really parents hard. Are very it's good really at hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And 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 the majority of parents do indeed, and therapists are much more um, aware. And I think teachers, everyone is aware of the demands on parents um, yes. in terms of juggling everything in the family and mm -hmm. trying to come up with the most um, practical ways of integrating mm -hmm. therapy goals into daily life and mm -hmm. all of that sort of thing. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so we as therapists have that drummed into us now for a good 30 years. <laughs> yeah. Very on that page and very yeah. um, much appreciate that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so no, the most mm -hmm. important person on the team is 100% the parent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, further to, yeah, so wait lists and getting access to allied health is definitely an issue. I think, Kerry, when we were talking previously um, and you were finding resources for your kids in their particular circumstance, you lent on a lot of um, community support services. Yeah, um, sorry, um, local library, um, like the public mm -hmm. libraries, local councils. And back then we had was called CAFs, Child and Family Health Services, you know, the owners of the blue book that you take home from hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it's like in other maternal states. Maternal health nurse. Yeah. yeah, maternal health nurse. So, you know, when they were younger, they sort of did that. And they flagged a lot of things. Like they were the ones that picked up with our eldest one, you know, that maybe go and get him tested for a few things. And they actually mm -hmm. weren't sure whether it was um, a learning disability or the other end of the spectrum, you know. So mm -hmm. it, they flagged it early on for us. But... Um, yeah, we relied a lot on those public health, like going to the local library and the council chambers and all the brochures and resources there. But now, of course, you can log on to your council website and access a lot of that as well. So mm. I think, you know, having that digital access is probably a game changer for a lot of people as well. But yeah, definitely we leaned on a lot of um, local and public health resources early on because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, you know, until you start looking. Start off with, and then you're like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we There's go? There's stuff from out there. there. Yeah. And if and if you can't find it initially, then mm. asking the questions of the people that you do get in front of generally will lead you to the next thing for sure. Um, not being afraid to ask the questions. Yeah. Not thinking, oh, I won't say anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ask all of the questions. Mm. In the, in that regard, so um, I know, and it's such a um, how long is a piece of string question, but. Say we've got um, so um, kids who struggle to remain focused um, 
have lots of energy sitting down for extended periods of time and not um, it's not their favorite thing to do in the slightest. Do either of you have suggestions for easy, low cost things that can be just kind of trialed or and like what 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 would you what would you be your first port of call for that penny? There's so much there, and that would be a big number of referrals that we have is that particular referral concern. So, so that's actually an easy one <laughs> um, because there. But are it does. It covers so many kids as well. So, that's like, right. what can they do? <laughs> what can they do? So, there's lots program? of programs that um, teachers are, are very aware of these days in schools, mm -hmm. like Alert Program and the Zones Program. A lot of teachers know those programs and use them. They're quite well used across Australia now. So they they good ways of helping children learn about self-regulation mm -hmm. um, so that they're um, not re requiring equipment, um, maybe using visual supports, but um, that's all. Um, and then and then there's lots of sensory tools as well. So to keep a child on the mat, we've got things like how to hugs and um, move and sit cushions and disco oh, sits and things what, like how that. How to hug? How to hug is like a, a, like a little reclining um, chair that hugs the child so it gives them proprioceptive deep pressure input they can move a little bit um, but they st they can get their movement they can get some deep pressure which is calming and they can stay sitting on the mat and be focused if they've got low muscle tone it gives them some postural support as well so so there's lots of different um pieces of equipment that can help um, using things like timers so the child knows they only have to stay on this task for a set period of time and then they, they can do something you know like things like that are, are great strategies to put in place so we have heaps of different timing options um, on our website and yeah th those would be the big ones but I, I think a, a key factor in it too is identifying what the sensory issue is that's when mm. we do the sensory profiling and why yep. they are seeking that movement and is it just simply that or um, and when you do the sensory profiling it helps you identify other ways or the most appropriate ways to what um, to handle it for that particular child yeah, like awesome. are they a, um, a tactile seeker as well so can we give them something tactile to help them stay focused rather than needing to move all the time so can, yeah. like, things like that can mm -hmm. can what's help the input them. that they need for that particular circumstance That's right. yeah Amazing. And then all different sensory profiles i did have charts the other day there's 24 different <laughs> things that Brilliant. we you know like once then that's the reason to do that sensory profiling to help animals yeah. so where is that child fitting here and what and strategies that's something that can is gone be. through with an ot specifically yeah. for that child yes yeah, yeah. okay so then i uh, just not that it's it's definitely not an assessment and it's not medical advice but then the two shop kerry you developed a very simple quiz which um can give parents some idea of specific um disability needs yeah, and yeah, how local resources yeah for different disability mm -hmm. needs so as you say it's not by any means yep. a medical assessment but it's just no. a very general so if you for know ideas. that you have yeah so if you have um sensory challenges we've got a whole list of suggested products that relate to that if you've got executive functioning you know um, challenges we've got a whole list of products that relate to that but people answer about 20 cas 20 questions and it gives them a rough summary so again not a medical assessment not no. <laughs> professional advice but just a starting point for people and I think as you were saying Penny like in the um, schools I know my to be daughter-in-law to be um, I was telling a vet this the other day that she was talking to one of the boys in her class when she said you know what's the best thing tell me the best thing that's happened and he said this this is the best thing that's happened and she put a rubber band a big rubber band across the two legs of his chair so if he was feeling fidgety he could just flick it with his foot and so as you say it doesn't have to be high tech or expensive or anything like that it was just something for him yeah, that yeah. worked for him so she just put it on his chair and he thought it was amazing you know mm. it cost her nothing and it kept him focused yeah sometimes it's very simple things yeah yep. mm. And I know she spends a lot of time at the start of each year. Um, she looks at, you know, what, what kids she's got coming into her class, what the makeup of their needs are, and then she will set up zones in her classroom, you know, like a really quiet zone, a darker zone, uh, you know, all this sort of thing so the kids mm. can actually go and do things in those different areas. But she's in a school that is very supportive of the teachers being mm. able to personalise their classrooms, you know, so that makes it easier for her, for her too. But, yeah. Mm. 
There's been huge change in that area with yeah. teaching. There's been a lot of professional development over the last however many years. And, and where we used to get lots of referrals for like fine motor skills, for example, as OTs, we don't get many of those referrals anymore because teachers have been really upskilled in those Adapt areas. Their, like um, teaching, yeah. Yeah, so so when we get them, they're more sort of specific kinds of issues that they've already had a go at, and it's sort of still still need more input. Um, whereas the regulation and the sensory stuff, they've now there's a lot of um, PD been going on in that area as well. So a lot of teachers are doing exactly what you're saying, adapting their classroom environments to allow for for those sorts of things for all kids, not just kids who've been identified as having an issue. So so that's great. Yeah. So, yeah, are there any other? So that seems like, yeah, the the continuous upskilling of teachers, changing needs of students in the classroom in this day and age, they're modifying. Can you, Penny, do you see any other trends emerging that may change how education is delivered or? AI. <laughs> yeah. That's the obvious one. And for um, our kids with um with particular issues it's awesome like mm. the the implications and the opportunities that the AI offers is just fabulous and the different softwares that you can use because of it to help kids with their learning is just makes it so much easier for teachers to adapt adapt curriculum as well they can how can that be applied sorry just so that I can figure out with AI as a teacher, you can sort of say, you know, I need a curriculum for a 10-week program for my 10-year-olds, um, focusing on the theme of trains and look at um, we want to go through the different cities of the world or something like that. And AI will spit out a curriculum in about five minutes with activities mm -hmm. for each week. And then you can say, okay, can you make that more appropriate for eight-year-olds? Or um, you can, like, and it will... It's just adapt fantastic. and, adapt it so and then, give you the activities, give you yeah. worksheets, give you everything. Just, just save so teachers so AI much AI is reducing the curriculum strain for teachers so they can focus on actually facilitating the learning, which is ultimately what they're supposed to be doing anyway. So they're becoming, right. yeah, yeah, facilitators as opposed to just yeah. straight out rote learning, teaching on a blackboard yeah. sort of and then, then there's software available as i put it out to our team before today just to say what's what's your latest things that you've come across that would you know you you could share um and they've come back at me with all sorts of different programs and things which and then i've googled them and have had a look because i'm not in the field at the moment so so that was um great but in like about, well like snap type is one where the kids is that the right one um yeah, so they can take a picture of a worksheet and then um, download that into their um, device, or iPad or whatever, and then answer the questions on the worksheet in the right spots with their keyboard. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just so much easier for them. So yeah. and and they can use voice to text with that as well. Yeah. So you know, all of those text to voice and voice to text options make huge. Um, you know, they're far better products these days. They work really well. Um, the easy spelling apps is drawing um, AI on. Um, it's called Crayon that they were with an I, um, where the child can put in what they want the um, software to draw and if it's not exactly what they want then they can type in um, other like specifications so from a language skill point of view it really oh, yeah. really quite motivating Articulating for them and, and then they, yeah. describing yeah, yeah. amazing so, um, and then there's all the stuff for low vision Siri and Alexa and all of that so yeah, yeah like heaps of fabulous options awesome. which just make things a lot more accessible and where you can combine two things as well. What's the other one? An example. Um, like if you're using remedial reading software plus audio books for a child with dyslexia. So they're they're still working on their reading skills, but they're not being held back by that. They can still access yeah. literature by using audio books. So mm. so it's the, the combination of things to to go around and through at the same yeah, time. For sure. Yeah. A multi um, sensory approach for sure. Kerry, have you to seen have a work oh, around as well as yes? So you are still working Strength. on that skill, but you're also yeah. allowing the child to work around at the Access, same time. Yeah. That's the best use of AT when you you, you can do yeah. that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think too that knowing that in the society these children are growing up in, digital literacy is such an important skill. And if we can actually help, you know, the, their learning be more accessible, improve their digital literacy and actually help them hone skills which are going to be relevant when they go to mm -hmm. uni or to the workforce or just out mm -hmm. into the big wide in world. Life. Yeah. In life. Like this is engaging for them. And I remember a, a talk that I went to when ICT was the new thing here in South Australia and the head of um, information technology at the education department came and spoke and he said the biggest analogy I can give, he said, is that, you know, when a kid goes up to it, when we got to a fridge as an adult, sorry, you open the fridge, you just expect things to be cold and stay fresh. You don't worry about how it works in the background. And that's what technology should be like for these kids in schools. It should just be a, a tool that's used just like their their pens, their papers, mm -hmm. you know, their sports equipment. It's just another tool. And I think the more we can help people understand that it's not um, holding them back from learning to write properly or holding them back from, you know, learning to read properly, it's actually enhancing their life and their self-esteem and their motivation and their engagement. And that, I think, is the biggest gift that we can give kids. Yeah, amazing. Mm. All right, I think before we keep going, because we could obviously talk about this all day with both yeah. of your um, knowledge. Erin, um, did we have any questions come through while we've been chatting? Uh, we haven't had any come through the chat today, but we did have a couple in the community um, earlier on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, a couple of them you've already answered because you've gone through so much information. It's been fantastic. There was just one that I'll bring up because we've mostly been talking about younger children, but this was a question about an older child, so it might sort of give a bit, bit of a different view. Um, but it was, my child is about to start high school and has developed crippling anxiety that has affected their learning. Is it too late to implement something here for them? Any Either thoughts you on that? Take, <laughs> take that and run. Oh, you're on mute, Kerry. Well, that, that's, I was going to say, that's a penny question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, the way we handle that is we have several therapists who are really um, good in that particular area. So they, so we refer straight to them, and they are fantastic. And so there are a lot of uh, resources and programs, and 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 we do have quite a lot of stuff on our website now for regulation and anxiety um, tools. So there's there's mm. books and there's different things. So. Um, so it's definitely really not too late. Like that. It's not. Oh no, no, definitely not too late. <laughs> no, 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 hundred percent. In fact, this is often when things do emerge, mm -hmm. um, in that, particularly in that space. So, so yes, and the uh, with anxiety, the sooner it's tackled, the better. The more um, strategies that kids can learn to put in place, um, in, you know, their own cognitive behavioural type strategies as well that they can you know they get rid of the stinking thinking and all of that sort of stuff so so there are a lot of tools that they can be introduced to very quickly so whether it be OT or psych mm -hmm. um, can both um, introduce so tools without for any kids. further information about how the child's navigating their life you would suggest going to their GP for a referral for that sort of situation Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Would you just go straight to like a psychologist referral if it's anxiety? Um, anxiety, it, it can be both. There's mm. quite, OTs have quite a lot of tools in that space as well. Um, it, like you can use mental health care plan as well with the, the GP. So um, I would start with what it, whoever you can get into, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Realistically, that's, that is, that's the that's challenge. The reality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also it's about the person that the child connects with. So, yeah. particularly a teenager, it needs to be someone. That, so you might go to an OT and they they just don't gel. So then they need to yeah. go somewhere else, or or vice versa. So it's um it's really about the connection, as well as the um strategies that that person is introducing for for that mm -hmm. child. So we run um ladybug groups um for like i don't know if you've heard of the yellow ladybugs national neurodiverse no, girls what's that? it's a national organization for neurodiverse girls oh um, there you go girls and women so um it's called the yellow ladybugs so we run ladybugs programs which is kind of like we start at six to eight we have our little ladybugs and then we have our orange ladybugs which is primary school age so really picking up on those girls nice and young and supporting them in their friendship skills and things like that so that they are very neuro-affirming sort of 
practice and Amazing. teaching them to be advocates for themselves and all you know, mm. to recognise their own sensory needs, for example, and be able to say to their teachers, I do better if I'm allowed to do da 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 da, da or whatever. So they learn that nice and young and um, develop those Even skills. Even just the language and the, yeah. the sentences to say to, yeah, advocate for yourself mm. would be yeah. hugely affirming for sure. Mm. So, and there's no doubt programs like that around Australia. Um, mm. so, yeah, so those mm. sorts of things that, awesome. that um, parents can access, yeah. I'll definitely be Googling that one and adding it to the list of resources for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. I guess, yeah, I think um, that'll probably do. I think we're getting to the end of our time today anyway. So thank you. All right, so we've we've made it to the end of the webinar. Um, because The conversation doesn't have to end here. Join us on Kenora. It's free to join if you're not a member already. Jump in and ask any other questions you have or share your experiences. Thank you for being here today, Kerry and Penny. Uh, Thank you for sharing your incredible insights and your experience in this space. Obviously, it's a hugely important topic and um, new AT developments and education developments are happening on the regular. Um, it's great to have you both as part of the um, Kenora um, expert resources that we have um, in our circle. So thank you again for being here. Um, Thank you to everyone who attended the webinar today and who are watching this as a replay. Uh, we'll be sending the email out to you uh, and anyone who's registered for the webinar uh, with the video replay and all of the resources that we've talked about. Uh, and of course, we will post the video and resources into the Kenora community too. Um, I'm Yvette, that was Erin. We've joined, we've been joined today by Penny Melson from Skill Builders in Western Australia and Kerry Kingham from the Chew Shop uh, in South Australia. Uh, we hope to see you in Kenora soon. Thanks very Thank much, ladies. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank see you. Bye. Bye.